All right. Good morning, church. I love that. You guys were waiting for some brilliant solution from Manny, right? So we have discovered a solution. Sit closer to each other, and it's solved. All right, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to uh, Exodus chapter 13. We're going to look at uh, 13, 17 through chapter 14 uh, in the crossing of the Red Sea. And uh, we're going to do as we've been doing through our study of Exodus. We're going to read a large chunk uh, at this point. This is probably a story that all of you know. You've read about the Red Sea crossing before. Uh, if you grew up in church, you heard this in children's ministry uh, once a month your whole life growing up. This is a big story uh, in Scripture and for good reason. But I think as we read through it, it will refresh our hearts to see it in one big chunk and setting. So if you'd follow along in your Bibles, we'll start in chapter 13, verse 17. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But, let, but God led the people of Israel around the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses, verse 19, took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Then, verse 1 of chapter 14, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi-Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea. In front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When, verse 5, the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamped at the sea by Pihahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. Verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the, in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, will, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then, verse 19, the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then, verse 21, 
Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went about into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then, verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus, verse 30, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this passage, very sobering in so many ways. But Lord, today as we think about this great victory, salvation that you won for Israel, we pray, Lord, that, you, that it would resonate, echo into our hearts today. Teach us of your victory that you perform for all who believe and trust in you. We thank you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a defining moment or episode uh, for the people of Israel. Uh, we know this. Uh, the story of the Red Sea, everything that we just read, what it meant for Israel is that their victory uh, was total. It was secure. It was complete. Uh, Egypt and Pharaoh, their stranglehold on the Hebrew people was broken once and for all through the waters of the Red Sea. It's a, it's a powerful story. Uh, it's, a, it's a story that today I hope to use to demonstrate uh, that when we believe in Jesus, we partake of a salvation that is similar to the salvation that God won for the people of Israel at the Red Sea. But before we think of it in that way, I want to just stop, slow down for a second, and celebrate how the events of this chapter have comforted and encouraged God's people for thousands of years. I mean, I know for me, just even thinking about this passage over this last week, setting my heart upon it, reading about it, thinking about it, praying about it, I'm just conscious of how many times God had, has used this passage to comfort and encourage me. How many times over the course of my Christian life, there have been moments where I felt like there was no way out, like I was totally trapped, like I did not know what the next good move would be. And then God revealed a way where there previously was no way. And I think for the people of Israel, they would look back on this story in that way. God, you were so faithful in that moment. You were so uh, ready to open up to us the waters of the Red Sea and show us a path that we never dreamed of before. And I'm sure many of you in this room, God has, been, God has used this passage in your life in that way. He's taught you to be still and see the salvation of the Lord. So this is a powerful passage of scripture. It has great theological meaning and great devotional meaning is what I'm alluding to today. So, so what I want to do is I want to think about three lessons that I really believe the people of Israel would have learned or, or begun to learn as they pass through the waters of the Red Sea. And all three of these lessons are lessons that we should learn as well ourselves. And the first one is this. Number one, they, we must embrace God's leadership. We must embrace God's leadership. That, that really is the section of the book of Exodus that we are entering into as we begin this passage of Scripture. Up to this point, 
in the book of Exodus, God has been coming down to rescue his people, to meet them in their affliction, but he is pictured from this moment forward as being with his people to lead and guide them throughout their lives. In fact, Exodus 13, 17, which is the starting verse of our passage today, all the way through Exodus chapter 18 is considered a chunk of the book of Exodus where God leads uh, his people. Uh, There will be six events that occur in these five chapters Uh, spanning the course of two months. We're not entering into the long wilderness uh, wandering that resulted uh, was a result of Israel's rebellion against God in the book of Numbers, their disbelief. We're entering into a time where God wanted to train his people through a couple of months of events out there in the wilderness before they went into the land of Canaan. They're going to cross the Red Sea. They're going to see the bitter water at Marah turned drinkable. They're going to receive manna from heaven. Water is going to be provided from a rock. They're going to defeat Amalekite raiders who attack them. And eventually, they're going to receive counsel from Moses' father-in-law, a man named Jethro. And in each one of those episodes, we'll see God leading his people like a shepherd leads his flock. And the whole thing is framed as a passage about God's close and good leadership of his people. I mean, look at verse 21 of chapter 13. We already read this, but it says that the Lord, at the very beginning of this whole section, went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire, that they might travel by day and by night. And God's presence in this pillar of cloud or fire, it says in verse 22 of chapter 13, did not depart from before his people. In other words, God is pictured here at the very beginning of this leadership motif as close with his people, ever present with his people, leading his people. And at the very end of this whole section, at the chapter 18, when Jethro meets with Moses, he will rejoice with Moses for all the good that the Lord had done for the people of Israel over the previous two months and how he had delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians. In other words, God starts leading in chapter 13, and in chapter 18, they ruminate on God's leadership and say, it's been so good. God has been so faithful. His leadership has been one of a kind. But that does not mean that God's leadership was straightforward. Uh, Of this section that we're entering into, one scholar said, it is an unbeatable illustration of the sheer oddity of life under divine leadership. In, In other words, God leads in a way that is so different than the way we might think that he should lead. So what can we learn about God's unconventional leadership from a passage like this one? What would they have learned? Well, I, I think one of the things that they would have learned and that we need to learn is there apparently is a need in God's leadership to trust his route for our lives. At the very beginning of this whole movement, uh, in chapter 13, verse 17, we see that God did not lead them straight to the land of Canaan by the straightest and most logical route. It would have taken about 10 days to get to Canaan through the land of the Philistines, but God took them on a circuitous route of about two months to get to their destination. He didn't want them, apparently, to be discouraged by the possibility of battle or war and desire to return back to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness, it says, toward the Red Sea. This was the first in God's desire to stretch, like I said, a 10-day trip into a one-year discipleship journey at seven distinct campsites. Uh, Israel simply was not ready for battle, so God led them in a different direction. Now, there are times where we might not understand why God isn't taking a more direct approach in our lives. But he had his reasons then, and he had his reasons, has his reasons now. You know, many of us are linear, logical thinkers. You know, we we have our plans, and when we come to God in prayer, uh, it's really a simple thing. We're like, God, here's the issues, here's what's going on, and here is what you need to do. 
I've got it all worked out. Just release your power. You don't need your wisdom. I'm supplying that. But what I need now is your power, your ability. So, so do the thing that I have worked out and that I have planned. And in the work of the kingdom, we often fall to this. We think we see the best route, the direct paths that God should take us on. But God's way is often not that way. God's way is often circuitous and winding. And here, what God needed to do, the reason that he didn't take them directly to Canaan, he reveals it. He, he, he needed to prepare the Hebrew people for conflict, for war, by winning a massive victory without their help. And on top of that, what God wanted to do through this victory at the Red Sea was completely disarm their Egyptian captors. Because of this episode, uh, they knew of God's power in battle, and the Egyptian threat no longer had to loom over their heads. And so I would say we need to let God lead our lives on unexpected routes. We need to let God take us into unexpected paths. Uh, one story from the New Testament that comes to mind is the story of Peter. You know, Peter had been a fisherman. Of course, it was a wild thing for him to follow Jesus those three, three and a half years. But after Jesus rose from the dead, Peter was commissioned into a life of apostleship. He got to be used by God in some magnificent ways. Ten days after Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church, and a, a large crowd gathered together, and Peter got to be the one who stood up in front of all of these people, thousands of people, and proclaimed the gospel to people who had not previously believed it. And their hearts were opened, and thousands came to Christ that day. He got to be used by God in amazing ways. And for the first ten years of the church's existence and life, Peter held court there in Jerusalem. There were times he got in trouble, times he was persecuted, but by and large, it was a fruitful, powerful 10 years of ministry. One day, though, Peter was on a trip. He went up the coast to a city called Joppa. At lunchtime, he was on the roof of the house that he was staying in while others were downstairs preparing lunch. And I think that Peter was hungry because as he was praying and talking to God, he had a vision of foods to eat. The unfortunate thing is that they were all foods that he, as a Jewish man, was not allowed to eat. They were unclean foods. But he heard a voice from the Lord saying, rise, Peter, kill and eat. I'm telling you to eat these things. I'm telling you that they're clean. And he argued with the Lord. He said, Lord, not so. I've never eaten as a Jewish man anything common, anything unclean. I'm not allowed to touch this food. But then the Lord caused a contingent of people from the north to come and knock on Peter's door. They said, we're here looking for a guy named Peter. Our master, a man named Cornelius, was praying, and an angel said to him that we should come here and ask for Peter and that he would explain the way of God to us more fully. And Peter began to understand that God was leading his life in an unconventional new kind of way, a new direction for his life. And he began to obey the Lord. He went up to Caesarea and preached the gospel. And what he saw was like a Pentecost part two. He preached the gospel. All these Gentiles believed and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And I think in like manner, we should celebrate that God has his plans. They so often violate our plans, but we should yield to them. Perhaps you're a little frustrated by that. You don't like that. And so I have an assignment for you, if this is a frustrating experience for you, to trust God in his wisdom. What I want you to do is I want you to find a little child, maybe three or four years old. But uh, you have to make sure that this child has never played or learned the game of checkers ever in their lives. Then I want you to sit down with them, and I want you to give them a crash course on the game of checkers. Maybe show them a YouTube video or something like that, teaching them how to play the game. And then I want you to sit across the table from them, and I want you to play seven or eight games of checkers with them. And I want you to give it your very best effort. I want you to crush them. I, I want you to destroy them in this game of checkers. And what I want you to watch is their logic versus your logic. I want you to watch how you are thinking one or two or three moves in advance, but all they can see is the move that's right in front of them that will so often lead them into a trap, lead them to be defeated. Then when the games are over, and I hope that you're smart enough to defeat them in all seven or eight of these games, when the game is over with, I want you to take a step back. 
And I want you to ask yourself if the distance between your wisdom and their wisdom is smaller or greater than the distance between your wisdom and the wisdom of God. God sees so many moves ahead of us. And so God can be trusted. Now, I do want to add that I don't really want you to go crush a little kid in checkers this week, but it's just a sermon illustration, okay? You're like, I am leaving this church. This pastor is so mean. Okay, but I think another thing about God's leadership that they would have learned is that it's important to move forward in obedience to God even when you don't see how it's going to work out, even when you don't see a way. What do I mean by that? Well, The passage shows us that after Pharaoh realized that the people weren't going to return after a few days of worship, in other words, once Pharaoh realized, I've lost my uh, workforce, my free workforce, my my slave workforce, Uh, he was disappointed, but then he heard a report from his messengers that the people of Israel had taken a hard right turn and that the land had hedged them in. They're up against the Red Sea, but then there's land on their uh, north and south that is going to pin them in. They've got nowhere to go. They're surrounded on three sides. And so he decides to get his horses and chariots and pursue Israel. Now, Now, this led, as we read in the story, to widespread panic among God's people, uh, they get very dramatic, right? They, they start speaking to Moses about their impending deaths. They, they say, this is so artful in verse 12, they say, is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? The reason I say that's artful is because Egypt had dedicated tons of land to graves. I mean, we still think of the pyramids as one of the wonders of the ancient world. That's a big grave, <laughs> So they're just like messing with Moses. Like everybody knows there were plenty of places to die in Egypt. We could have just stayed there and done that. They told Moses that this is why they had told him to leave them alone to serve the Egyptians. Now, to be fair, we have no record of them ever saying this. Uh, So I don't know if they said this or not, but maybe you've been in an argument before where you claim to have said things that you did not say previously. I said, I know I said it. I remember saying it. They say that they said that to Moses. They claim to have wanted to put their heads down and keep on slaving in Egypt rather than listen to Moses. And they're thinking, I, I think the only way to describe it is binary. They could die in the wilderness or they could slave in Egypt, there was, they could not imagine any other outcome. Have you ever been in that place in your life where you're looking at the situation and you, in your thinking, you're like, there's one of two things that could happen. Well, God had something in store that they could never have dreamed of. There was no gray area here, no nuance here, no faith here. The curse of the two-option mind came over them. So Moses Moses told them in verse 13, he said, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. He told them that that they would never again see these Egyptians, that the Lord would fight for them, and all they had to do, verse 14, was be silent. Now, I'm one of the first people to say that there are lots of times when we read verses in the Bible, and because we're not steeped in grace or because we're not steeped in who God is, we read these verses with a negative or harsh tone when we should not, and they were not intended that way. I'm the first one to, to, to say that. But I think that we've done the opposite with these two verses from Moses. I think we have taken verses and words that were meant to be a rebuke, meant to be a, a, an effort to silence them in their complaint, and we have turned them into a devotional soft word. Don't worry, everybody. Just be silent. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. I'm going to put it in a card, and I'm going to send it to my friends kind of thing. And you can use it for that, of course. But I think that Moses and God were coming at this from a more corrective posture. Part of the reason I think this is because this type of behavior in the future in the book of Exodus clearly frustrated Moses, but that's not all. The big clue that this was meant as a corrective word is that God after said in verse 15, why do you cry to me? Moses was a representative of God's people. So God threw him in with this complaining lot 
and said, this is not a time for complaint. This is a time for action. And God said in verse 15, right after Moses had said these things, tell the people of Israel to go forward. Where were they to go? He said, forward. Hemmed in by the land and Pharaoh's chariots behind them, the way forward was into the Red Sea. This story, in other words, was meant to help them see with eyes of faith rather than continually interpret life by their own natural vision. As they assessed the situation with their natural sight, they were trapped on all sides. There was no path. There was no way to go. But God's commission to move forward meant that there was a way that they could not yet see. So many of us, we hear God's commissions. We hear what God is asking us to do. I think in particular, we hear of the ethics that God asks us to live out as his people. And we think to ourselves, in this day and age, it's impossible. In this day and age, there's no way. With the drives and desires I have, there's no way. But God has a way where there feels to be no way. And God is looking at us as his children and saying, You just need to move forward in obedience to me, and I will take care of the rest. I can recall quite a few uh, trail runs that I have gone on in my life where I've invited a friend to join me, where when we get to the site, we park our cars, and we're heading out on the trail, uh, bad weather or fog or something like that cuts down our visibility, where we can only see 30 or 40 or 50 feet uh, out in front of us. And uh, on those runs, I, I, I remember that, you know, for me, I've been to those places many times, and I know where I'm going. I know what turns to take when they appear. I know when to go straight or left or right, when to go up or when to go down. But the person that's with me, having been there for the very first time, they become disoriented. Is, are we really supposed to turn here? Are, are we really supposed to go up this hill? Are we really supposed to turn right here? Are we really supposed to go down in this place? Without visibility and having never gone on that route before, they began to question and wonder or be simply surprised by the various turns we would make. This is like our journey with God. God can see. God knows the path. God knows the destination. We do not. We're often hiking in the dark or running without visibility. So we need to trust our guide. What a lesson I think this episode is for us. We, we often spend so much time arguing with God's directives because we feel they're incompatible with what we see or hear or feel. Rather than deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him, we complain. But our God is the God who can part the waters, who can cut the lake, who can divide the stream. He can walk on top of the waters if he needs to. He commands the sea, and just as he did At creation, after he tells the waters what to do, dry land appears. So let's move forward in obedience to the word without complaining and watch God open up paths we could have not previously seen. Amen? Okay, the second lesson I think that is here from this passage is that we need to walk in God's salvation. This is a really huge part of what this whole episode is about. We need to walk in God's salvation. When Moses lifted up his staff, God split the sea. And he, he was showing us what his victory looks like. That when I win victory for people, this is, this is what it looks like. This is how I do it. They would sing about this forever. We're going to actually study their song next Sunday morning in Exodus chapter 15. But the song that they sang, it reverberates throughout the story of God's people. Uh, the Red Sea episode and song was on their mind 40 years later when they crossed the Jordan River and God held back the waters there. The Red Sea song was on their mind when the Philistines would invade them or others would invade them and attack them. The Red Sea song was on their mind in generations later when they were carried captive into Babylon. After 70 years, God began saying, I'm going to bring you back to me. They began trusting that God was going to give them a new exodus. And of course, when Jesus arrived, a greater than Moses parted the waters that were greater than the Red Sea. We were entrapped, not by land and not by water, but by our sin, by the world system, by the principalities and powers of darkness. And though it seemed we were doomed, Christ took on human flesh. He fulfilled the law for us so that through his death and resurrection, the waters parted and we found life in him. And one day, the final conquest, the last exodus, will occur when Jesus returns. 
you know, the people of Israel in their setting, their ancient Near East setting, they did not view the ocean or the water as a positive thing. They, they viewed it as a chaotic force that contained evil. So when God parted the Red Sea, when God held back the Jordan River, or when Jesus walked on water or calmed the storm, it spoke of God's power over wicked chaos in their world, God's dominance over danger. And in the final passage of the Bible, it's so interesting, the Apostle John He records his vision of the future. He records his vision of the new heavens and the new earth. And he throws in this little line in Revelation 21.1. He says, and the earth had no more sea. This is not meant to be a phrase that makes all the surfers in the world really sad. Oh, no, there's no sea in heaven, no surfing in heaven. It's not meant to make people who live on the coast like us sad or something like that. What it was meant to communicate is that God will one day defeat the powers of chaotic darkness once and for all that are emblematic there in the sea. So this Red Sea crossing, it's been relived many times in the pages of Scripture. One critic of the Bible doesn't like the Bible. He said, Exodus is the only thing that ever happens in the Bible. (laughs) And uh, I like that. I'll take it. It's true. It's a story over and over again of God seeing people in their despair, rescuing them out to bring them into relationship with himself. It's like a recurring cinematic concept that appears in movie after movie. We we keep watching movies. They keep making movies, but they're all about the same things. It's just the same story retold in different ways. And over and over again, the story of Exodus occurs. Thousands, millions, billions can say, I was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. This is what God is doing. And Paul told the church in Corinth, who, by the way, were not Jewish. They were Gentile for the most part. He told them that the generation that crossed the Red Sea were their fathers. In other words, Paul gave permission to the church to say, the Red Sea story, it's our story. We're connected to it. Those were our forefathers that were crossing that water. So if the salvation that they walked in is the salvation we should walk in, what does this episode show us that God's salvation is like? And there's a lot of things we could say. We could say God's salvation is God initiated, amen? God is the one who initiates this whole thing. They're just standing by. All they have to do is be quiet. (laughs) And Moses puts out his rod, the waters part. And so God, this is a God initiated thing. We could also say God's salvation is entered into by faith. You know, he opened the waters, but they needed to receive what he had prepared for them. They needed to, by faith, take that road that God had given to them. And there are some of you here today, you're hearing the gospel, you're hearing that Jesus died for you, you're hearing that he took your place on that cross and that he rose from the grave three days after his death, but you need to trust him, you need to believe in him. Those waters are opened, but you need to step into it by faith. But the thing that I wanna say about God's salvation is simply this. God's salvation as presented in Exodus 14 is that it is total. It is total. That's the whole idea of this passage. You see, on that day, Pharaoh's hard heart clouded his mind and caused him to rush his armies into the sea in pursuit of the Israelites. He he wanted his slaves, but Yahweh wanted his son So God threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogged their chariot wheels in the midst of the sea. When they realized that the Lord was fighting for Israel, they became determined to flee. But when Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Egyptian army was completely defeated. And alarmingly, it seems like something mysterious occurred at the waters that day because Exodus says, as the Egyptians, verse 27, fled into the Red Sea. It's as if the Lord put such a confusion upon them and that their hardness of heart had led to such a delusional perspective on reality that they were running into the sea to their demise and death. The victory that Christ gave to them was total and the victory that Christ wins for us is also total. Colossians 2.15 says that through his death and resurrection, Christ has 
disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them. It says in Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15, that it was Christ's aim that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Peter says, According to God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And in Romans 8, 37, Paul says, we have become more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Paul even says it this way in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. He says, thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. In other words, in God's view of things, trusting Christ means we are totally saved. Baptized into Jesus' death, we will be joined with him in his resurrection one day, making newness of life our destiny right now. Romans 6, verse 6 and 7 tells us that when Jesus died, we died with him. Our old self was crucified with him, he says, in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Romans 6, 8 and 9 goes on to say, since we died with Christ, we believe we'll live with Christ because we know that he will never die again and death no longer has dominion over him. Put another way, Romans 6, 10 says, Jesus died to sin once for all, so now he lives to God. He's alive with the Father. And because we're tied to Jesus, we must consider ourselves, he says in Romans 6, 11, to be in the same condition, dead to sin, and alive to God, just like Jesus is. That is total salvation. Okay, but the question that I have is, if, if this salvation that God wins for his people is total, then uh, why does it sometimes not feel like it? Right, if we're being honest. If we're being dishonest, then we hear about total salvation, and we act like victory is totally complete. We're living in it. I don't have any temptations, I don't have any struggles, I don't have any disobediences, I don't have any secret sins, I don't have any of that stuff. Total victory and salvation. So what's going on? Well, first we need to remember that the front half of Exodus is not the whole of the book of Exodus. The Red Sea didn't happen, the song happened, and then God said, the end. No, there's the rest of the story. The first half of Exodus is about pulling the Hebrews out of Egypt, and the second half of Exodus is about pulling Egypt out of the Hebrews. And God would do that by rewiring their hearts. He knew that centuries living as slaves in Egypt had taught them a certain grid or view of life, the world, and themselves, and it needed to be rewritten. It would be a long process. So he gave them feasts and festivals, and Sabbaths, and laws, and commandments, and a tabernacle, and an offering system, all as a way for them to get their hands, and their feet, and their eyes, and their minds, and their noses, everything involved in rewriting the story within their hearts. And God will do the same for us. It's known in the Bible as the process of sanctification. God is working, God is warring to help us experience the newness that we have in Christ. So I think we have to remember that. But I think we also need to do what Paul said a little bit more often. We have to consider ourselves to be as God says we are, dead like Jesus to sin and alive to God just like Jesus is. We have to count ourselves, reckon ourselves, believe ourselves, consider ourselves just as close to God and impervious to sin as Jesus because we are tied to Jesus. We have to go through that process over and over again in our minds by faith. I think a lot about those lepers that Jesus healed all throughout the stories of the New Testament. You know, in the Old Testament era, they had laws on the books about what a leper who had been healed needed to do, the sacrifices that they needed to offer. And uh, there's no record of them ever needing those 
uh, laws, those commandments. Because probably a leper probably had never been healed before. So it, I think about Jesus healing lepers, and then he says, go in and offer the sacrifice that you need to offer. And they did. And I, I imagine, though, them wondering from time to time if the victory that Jesus had given them was permanent or temporary. Now, every time an itch came, every time a little rash developed, I imagine them wondering, is the old me coming back? Is the victory that I received just a temporary victory? But that's not the way of Christ. His deliverance in their lives was total. And for us, when the old itch of sin beckons, we have to count ourselves as new with Jesus. That's who we are. Okay, one teeny tiny closing lesson that we can receive from this passage is simply this. We need to be grounded in God's love. We need to be grounded in God's love. Now, when I say this, I'll tell you why I'm saying this in a moment from this passage. But by love, I'm not alluding to warm feelings, God's warm feelings. And I'm also not alluding to God's general permissiveness over our lives. But I'm talking about the covenantal love that he chose to bestow on these descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He told them that they would inherit the land of Canaan, the promised land. And this generation was becoming reacquainted with those old ancient promises of God's covenant with them. You say, how do you know that? What do you mean? Well, way back in chapter 13, verse 19, it says that when they went out, what does it say? Moses, it says, took the bones of Joseph with him. Joseph was the first Hebrew to move to Egypt over 400 years earlier. And his story is found in the final movement of the book of Genesis. God had made him into the second most powerful man in Egypt. He made it possible for the rest of his family to move to Egypt and experience relative prosperity during an age of famine. They were days of peace and joy for the sons of Jacob, but for as much as Joseph believed that it was good for them to live in Egypt for a season, he also knew that God would fulfill his promises and bring them back to Canaan. And so, when God fulfilled his promise and visited them, Joseph gave them directions. He wanted them to carry up his bones with them from there. And Moses apparently had gotten wind of that story over 400 years later. He'd gotten wind of this command from Joseph to bring his bones with him. Joseph was operating as an Egyptian royal, and so it's probable that he was mummified in a big old coffin that they're carrying out of Egypt. The same guy who was the first one in, it's like he's the first one out of Egypt. And the people of Israel, as they looked at that cop, and as they began to ask themselves, who this? As they're doing all that, they're remembering the old story. God promised that we would have the land of Canaan. God promised that we would go back to that place. God is a God who fulfills his word towards us. It was a reminder that God is a covenant-keeping, faithful God and that his covenant of love cannot be broken. And I think we also need reminders of God's covenantal love. The more secure we are in it, the better we will be led into the future with him. God has been teaching me a lot about this just personally. You know, as, as as a pastor, as a leader, just as a father, just recognizing that at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's not about our faithfulness, it's not about our performance, it's not about our expertise, it's not about any of those things. It's just when I'm watching God doing great things, it's just his covenantal love. He has just for whatever reason decided that he would bless people like you and me. And we've got to be confident in that love, like the roots of a tree that go down deep into the soil and enable a tree to grow large and fruitful and prosperous. We've got to be grounded in the love of God.